and welcome to The Short Stuff. I'm Josh, and there's Chuck, and Jerry's here too, and so is Dave and Spirit, and we're coming at you from the future of right now. <laughs> this is one of those where I, uh, it's so interesting, so cool, so mind-blowing, and so promising, mm-hmm. and then you get to the very end, and then you're like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> to me, that just meant, just give it a little more time. No, and a lot of times that is the case, and, and probably will be in this case, but it was such a, oh. Uh, right. And you'll see what in about, you know, 12-ish minutes what we're talking about. So essentially what we're talking about first is data. We've got a lot of data. Like anytime somebody says something, thinks something, writes something down, somebody comes up with a new recipe or a new patent or whatever, that gets encoded. It's data that gets saved. We don't really throw stuff away anymore. And so we're kind of awash in data. And if you want to take that data and you want to save it, you want to preserve it, let's say it's really important like you're the Library of Congress. Sure. Get this, man. I did not realize this. What you do is you take that data and you transfer it onto the same kind of magnetic reels that those old room size computer mainframes used to to read and write data. Yeah, you put it on tape. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) I didn't realize that, but it's just the the proven go-to means of long-term, it's called archival storage, of the kind of data that you don't really need to access any anytime soon. Uh, it's called low-touch data. You're just putting it literally in cold storage. Yeah. I mean, it's been around for a long time. Very dependable, very durable, very reliable. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it doesn't cost a lot of money. It can hold a ton of data. Uh, one tape can hold uh, between 1 million and 15 million gigabytes uh, or 1 to 15 petabytes. Mm-hmm. That's a lot of stuff. <laughs> it really is. Uh, and they're, the problem is, and, you know, th- it's all relative, but um, they're kind of big, but not big, big. They're three inches by three inches, and you're like, eh, Chuck, that's not very big at all. But that is big when you talk about, you know, potentially billions of these things and having to store them in a place that is, uh, like you said, cold storage. So it's the cost of building these cold storage buildings Mm -hmm. uh, that is the issue uh, when it comes to this three-by-three-inch thing. That, and then also, you know, they've been around for three-quarters of a century, so we know they last that long if you keep them in cold storage, but we don't know exactly how long they will last. So there's also a question of that. So that combined with, so cost, uh, questions about how long it will last, and then also um, just the enormous amounts of information we're adding every year uh, are making people look for other ways to to encapsulate data, to encode data in in, in ways that are cheaper, that are smaller, that are uh, require less money to keep cold. Uh, and what they've come up with, Chuck, it, for anybody who has uh, looked at the, the title of this episode, they won't be very surprised, but DNA. That's right. I know it's early, but we got to take a break right there, right? Agreed. All right. We'll be right back. All right. So you dropped a pretty big truth bomb on everyone. Uh, I'm sure there were people that for 60 seconds were like, what? (laughs) Storing data on DNA, dude, that's in my body. Mm -hmm. Like, what are you talking about? Putting data in my body? You got that straight. Uh, You don't have that straight. But here's a a pretty good, um, as far as how much this stuff can hold, uh, this is pretty staggering stuff. And this is from uh, a couple of dudes from the Los Alamos National Lab. And uh, I think you got it from Scientific American. Mm -hmm. Uh, Here's how much DNA can hold. 74 million million bytes of information, which is basically the Library of Congress. That's a lot. That's a lot. You can put that, uh, if you were putting it on DNA, um, into the size of something as big as a poppy seed 6,000 times over. Right. Uh, Said another way, if you split that seed in half, you could store all of the data on Facebook. Yeah, and then by 2025, uh, the the size of the data that humanity's generated will reach an estimated 33 zettabytes. So it's 3.3 followed by 22 zeros of bytes of information. That's a lot of bytes. If you um, can transcribe that all into DNA, you could fit the whole thing into a ping pong ball. 
Yeah. Not a three by three plastic cartridge multiple times over. A single ping pong ball could hold all of the world's data. And you can make multiple ping pong balls as backups, too. Yeah, and you don't need to, and it's pretty easy to to duplicate them, apparently. Uh, And you don't need to keep them in the fridge, even though you could put it in in an egg carton. Sure. And be set. Uh, You don't even have to. It's going to last a long time. Uh, not being in cold storage, and probably even longer in cold storage. You could give a ping pong ball to every living human to keep in their fridge, and it, you, like, it would have no problem whatsoever. Be like, here, you keep this cold for 150 years. And only half of them would eat that ping pong ball thinking it was an egg. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so you'd still be left with all those backups. Uh, here's where it gets super interesting, though, because – you know, as most people listening probably are, like I said, as I was reading this, I was like, okay, that's a cool idea. But like, how in the world does this work? And it turns out that it's not that mind blowing or difficult. I'm not Mm -hmm. saying I could go out and do it. (laughs) But it makes a lot of sense to wrap your head around because uh, DNA, as we all know, uh, is composed of four uh, nucleotides, or at least combinations of uh, guanine, thymine, uh, adenine, and Cytosine, uh, mm-hmm. just remember GTAC. And Gattaca. <laughs> yeah. Uh, ooh, ironically. Um, all this digital data, though, is included um, that's out there in the world, and as everyone knows, in ones and zeros. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's, you know, it sounds like, you know, and it can be any combination of ways, but when you really break it down, it's really, you can either just have zero, 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 one, one, zero, or one, one, uh-huh. as far as those combinations go. And that's four things. And there are those four nucleotides. So if you just like say, hey, each one of these nucleotides is going to be assigned a different number, then that's all you need. There's, there's the key to your map. Yeah. So say adenosine stands for zero, zero. And um, guanine stands for 1-1 one, one, and so forth. Each one stands for one of those pairs of possible combinations. Then you can take any string of binary data, zeros and ones, and turn it into um, genetic code based on those nucleotides. So, like, uh, you would just have – you go from a string of ones and zeros to a string of A, T, Gs, and Cs. Mm-hmm. And that's it. The thing is, is you're not, you're not turning ones and zeros into letters. You're actually transcribing the ones and zeros from binary code into physical genetic material. You're yeah. actually putting a base of ad- adenosine right there. You're putting a base of um, thymine next to it. Like, depending on how the code reads with the ones and the zeros and what order they're in, you're actually physically creating genetic material, DNA. But rather than encoding the information to building a living thing, you're encoding the information to uh, the entire catalog of stuff you should know. And honestly, isn't that the first thing we should preserve in DNA? (laughs) Sure. Good. After the movies of Gene Wilder. How about at the same time as the movies of Gene Wilder? Can we just agree to that? How dare you? Hey, I think highly of us and Gene Wilder. Uh, I don't know why he's been on my mind lately, but he has been. He's been shaking it for you in your head? He's been shaking it for me. Um, so this all sounds great. And and like I mentioned at the very beginning, this is one of those things where you're like, holy cow, this is the future. This is it. And then the oh at the end. And the oh is that it's really expensive <laughs> To do this. Like, we we can do this. We figured out how to do this. It's possible. We have the tech to do this. But that, uh, here's a tape name, LTO-9. It's a magnetic storage tape. You can get it for eight bucks, and you can get one petabyte of storage. Mm-hmm. That would cost you about a trillion dollars to do for DNA. Yeah, there was a guy who was interviewed in Ars Technica named Hyun Jun Park. He's the CEO of a data storage company called Catalog. And he even estimated, he said, let's say it costs you three cents to print a single nucleotide. Yes, that's cheap, but for each base pair, now you're up to six cents, and then now you're translating gigabytes. You're entering millions of dollars. So if it costs millions of dollars to to, um, translate a gigabyte, it costs trillions of dollars to do a petabyte. And the other problem of it, too, Chuck, is that it's really, really slow, right? It's super slow. So this is a clear case of one of those things, like you mentioned, which is like, just wait. Because like with any technology, it's going to get quicker. It's mm-hmm. going to get cheaper. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know if this is like 100 years into the future. But I, I don't think at this so. point, the cost is is just so outrageous that 
there, there's no government is going to fund something like this. I mean, a trillion dollars for one petabyte of information is Too not – it, you're not going to sell that very, very easily. And then, yeah, like I was saying, the speed, um, if you're transferring information from uh, one of those um, magnetic storage tapes, mm-hmm. you're transferring it about a gigabyte per second typically. Um, if it takes even like a second – to print a single nucleotide, which is mm-hmm. still it's very fast, but you're th- we're thinking on human level fast. We need to think on like how many ones and zeros are in the average gigabyte of code. Um, now you're talking about decades to to transfer a petabyte disks worth of information using DNA technology. Yeah. So yes, it's very slow right now. It's very expensive right now. But I don't think we're 100 years off, Chuck, because we're able to do this now relatively cheaply because the, the Human Genome Project came along. That was 20 years ago. Think about how much, how long, how far we've come. And this is like the hardest chunk, the first 20 years. Yeah. I think it's just going to get faster and easier. I don't think we're going to be waiting 100 years to see DNA data storage. Does that mean that stuff you should know is in the hardest chunk? <laughs> when you're I, 15. I think so. Yeah, it feels like it. Okay. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, well, I'm teasing Chuck, right? Yeah. Just teasing, uh, which means, of course, uh, short stuff is out. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. <laughs>